institutionalized violence, uh, and that's not always covered in the media, that's not something you will see. Uh, as a youth, uh, something that I experienced that, that still, I believe, comes from the same place are gang injunctions. Um, as a as, you know, young 17-year-old walking in the streets, you know, and I'm, I identify as Mexican, I am a Chicano, uh, I was walking in the streets wearing typical white shirt, um, shorts, and uh, chucks, and I get stopped by a police officer. I was minding my own business, not saying anything, and he stops me and asks me, take your shirt off, I want to see if you have tattoos. Um, and and I, I try to resist as much as you can, but as a 16-year-old not understanding how things work, I just figured, all right, this is what I'll do. Um, I'll, I'll take off my shirt and, and show him that I don't have any tattoos. I'm not an officer, I'm not getting affiliated. I don't do those things, but um, because of the way that I look, because I have a, had a bald head at the time, uh, still do. Um, I, you get treated a certain way that other folks don't get treated. Other folks don't get just stopped in the street and uh, and have their rights taken away from them. Because at that moment, my rights were taken away. Like that, those rights that are afforded to most Americans were taken away based just on the way that I look. So those are some of the experiences that I've had as youth and now, uh, and, and being able to participate, you know, as a democratic citizen in this society. Hello, everyone. Okay. So I have a couple um, of experiences with how I have um, faced oppression. So first off, um, in high school, I was in the AP English class, and I was one of the two black kids in the class. And um, at the time, um, we were reading a book called The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And my, my, both my sister and I, my twin, were in the class, but my sister had a different teacher. And so my sister had borrowed a book from my teacher, and like a couple of days later, I, was, I told my teacher, you know, she'll give me back your book soon, and she's just still reading it. And under her breath, she said that coon, and she had called me a derogatory, or referred my sister as like a derogatory term. And I just kind of froze and I couldn't believe what I had heard. I felt very uncomfortable. I just felt like anxious. And so 
I sat back down, I thought about it, I was like, maybe I'm just hearing things. And it's kind of sad because as a person of color, sometimes when you hear certain things that you know aren't right, you feel like, oh, maybe I'm wrong. But just because you feel like no one's ever going to listen to you or believe what you said was true. And so I told my mom what had happened, and we went to the administration. And so I had to speak with the vice principal of my high school. And I told her what had happened, and she said, oh, maybe you just heard it correctly. And then she went on a tangent talking about how her son, she was white. She said how her white son has a black friend, and how she was describing him. She was describing her son's black friend as he had dreads, you know, they were best friends, and they were in band together. So she totally, like, discredited what I said, and just, I don't know, she was trying to make, I guess what the teacher said, justifiable, or try to brush her under the carpet, but I felt like, no matter what I do, if I do speak up, I'm always going to be ignored, and not, no one's ever going to take, take me seriously. And I think that kind of relates, like, Black Lives Matter, because it's not, for me, I believe it's just, it just doesn't stop at police brutality, but it, it's a, a life, like what Chantel said, it's a livestock thing. Like, you live it every day. It's not just, like, you wake up being black, you go to sleep, you go to bed being black if you can't change that. And so, um, to me, another example, um, I played soccer for a couple of years, and many girls on the team would say I was an Oreo or I was whitewashed because I didn't listen to rap music on the daily or because I didn't know who Tiger was. And so I told them, you know, why can't I just be me? Why do I have to fit into your box and your stereotype? And they just kind of laughed it off and just kept saying I was, I did it for the stereotypes, therefore I wasn't a black person. Um, just to give one more example, I'm sorry, kind of like dragging on, but this hits home for me because my little brother, he plays water polo, and he's a junior in high school right now, and he was the only black um, male on the team, and he was um, bullied, but racially, he would be called, called out of his name, or he would be called the N-word um, by his teammates, and when he would go into a locker room, they would physically abuse him, they would push him against the locker, they would, um, push, they would punch him in his chest and call him all these words, and he would come home crying. At some point, he just became numb to it, and so my parents, as my parents would tell him, you know, trying, you know, verbally try and tell him, you know, stop, like this isn't right. And it's sad because these are teammates they are supposed to have your back, and so we had to go to them. And my parents had to go to the administration and tell them what was going on, and it took them a while to actually make something happen. So they investigated and they talked to the boy that was mainly doing it. And it, it eventually stopped, but it's just, for me, it's beyond me, like someone would be judged for some colored skin and be treated not as a human just because the way they look. So, yeah, that's my experiences. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm super duper loud. I'm a little away from the mic. I'm eating the mic. Hi. Um, so I'm going to touch on black culture. Um, growing up, there's always like an eye-opening moment where you like re-realize that you are black um, <laughs> in America. As as weird as that sounds, so like I'll bring up black issues to certain people like on campus or with friends, and they'll be like oh, you're reading too much into it, I don't think it's that deep, I don't think you're really touching on, like, so-and-so. And these are non-black people trying to, like, critique me on what I see as my reality, mind you. Um, so it's already, like, frustrating within itself. But they don't have a problem participating in black culture. And so what I mean by that is I'll play a song or something or I'll dance and then they want to learn how to twerk or they want to learn the rap lyrics to Nicki Minaj's hottest song or they want to have their hair braided, or they want to wear some faux dreadlocks, Miley Cyrus, and be a part of the culture. <laughs> they want to be a part of the culture to a certain extent. So as soon as you, they want, they want to be a part of the culture, but they don't want to protect the culture. <laughs> okay, y'all with me? <laughs> so it's, it's really funny, it's like this weird divide that you like have to walk on this like straight pipeline that's like above sharp invested waters because these are people who like claim to be your friends. And when it comes time to like defend your life, 
and to be there with you and to bring up issues and to educate family members who still practice internalized racism and pass it on and don't see color, whatever that means. Um, they're not really there for you, which is really interesting. Um, and then relating to my personal experience on campus, last semester I was hanging out with some friends and a foreign exchange student thought it would be okay to call me a nigger in the middle of us meeting. Yes, I know, like completely uncalled for, idiotic for sure, but my friends were just kind of like, oh, like let's pretend that didn't happen, where of course I can't pretend that didn't happen. There's so much historical context to it and it touches on such a different level to me than them, where it's like they can go about their day because that's not a form of oppression that they have to deal with every day. So that's like a situation they can push to the back of their minds and then like that's it and that's all that they dealt with. Whereas for me, it relates to how I was seeing like all my life growing up, being followed in convenience stores, um, having my father shot on his way home two months before I was born, and then police not inspecting on the incident because they were like, well, you're from a bad neighborhood. This is what they told my mom, you're from a bad neighborhood. This was like kind of bound to happen. It could be anyone. And then that's kind of like where it was left. So that's like my father's uh, like dying note out in this world. So um, I guess my point is, is if you are going to participate in black culture and be really excited about being a part of black culture and want black friends and to be a part of blackness, you have to be a part of blackness to where you also have to defend it. Because if you're not defending, defending blackness, then you're just as bad as any oppressor. And you're not really seen as an ally, you're seen as an enemy. So it's just something to wake up to, but that's my experience. Hello, everyone. Um, so similar, similar experiences to the individuals um, that that's spoke so far, um, but flies, haters. Um, but anyways, <laughs> so. I thought long and hard about this, and um, I, I've really been trying to think what will I share with the audience, um, what, what piece of me, what type of oppression is so impactful that it will allow those to understand who think that it, it's, um, it's, a, it's not an anomaly, who will allow those to understand that it's real, um, these are actual lived experiences, it's not just, oh, that just happened to that individual, or um, she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they only do that over there, um, because there's so many, so many experiences, um, similar to Eugene, being followed in convenience stores. Okay, typical, everyone gets followed in convenience stores, and so that probably wouldn't work. Um, people crossing the street when they see you, um, maybe they were just going somewhere. Um, you know, clutching purses tired. Um, I had an experience where I was literally the only person in a, in a security aisle, and this would be my experience when I was reawakened to my blackness, um, similar to like Eugene said, like I, I rediscovered it, where there was a security check um, called while I was literally the only person in the aisle over the um, PA system. So that really did some things inside, some internal things. Um, that they wanted me to know that, hey, we see you, we see you being black, so don't take anything. Um, but I don't think all of those really get to what it is and to really show um, the listeners how I feel or my experiences. I think the biggest, biggest thing is, um, like it was said, just the lived experience, um, the weight that I feel on my shoulders every single day, um, no matter where I go. Um, if I'm walking through CSU Channel Islands, I, I know I'm a black person. Um, I, I have to be aware of actions as I may be perceived a certain way. Um, at nighttime, I have to be aware of um, what time of night, who's around. Um, if people are like, what, what's the speed of my pace? Um, will people think that I'm approaching them fast? If someone were to call the police and say that there's someone walking fast behind me, I'm genuinely scared that like, I could be approached and I could be killed immediately, despite my achievements, despite um, where I am, what I've done. So just 
every single day. Like, you're a black person no matter where I go. If I'm here, if I'm in Ohio, if I'm in Arkansas, Illinois Empire, literally no matter where, you have this weight on your shoulders, this weight on your heart, and it's not an anomaly. Um, it's years and years and years of oppression and years of growing up, as um, Chantel says. So that's my biggest experience. And um, you know, I I never want to be anything other than black. I love it with all my heart. But um, please understand that black people and um, other people of color too, I'm sure. But I can only speak of being a black person. Um, there's a weight. There's a weight on our shoulders. And um, all lives matter for sure, and we, we just want ours to matter um, as much as everyone else. Thank you. Hello, young folk. I can see in your eyes there are some inquisitive minds. More so, I'm on a panel with some rock stars, the way you applaud for them, so I'm glad to be on the panel with such distinguished students and faculty here. But this whole issue of Black Lives Matter is a tipping point. You ever get to a tipping point where you're not gonna take it anymore? You ever see a mother in the store and the child running around grabbing stuff, whining, and the mother get at a tipping point and they snatch them and pop them? You know. <laughs> Everybody gets to a tipping point. This whole process of Black Lives Matter, it was a tipping point. And the moderators asked me to give a couple of examples of oppression. You know, and, and oppression, is, it boils down to uh, authorities and powers inflicting a burdensome, cruel, unjust way on people, individuals. So I'll share a couple things with you. As a high school student, in 10th grade, the city of Pontiac, Michigan, Blue Hollow Town. The U.S. Supreme Court has just ruled that integration by busing is constitutional. So, the buses that transported my friends from the hood, and I say my friends from the hood, because my mom moved me out of the hood in my ninth grade year, and I was so mad. You can't take me out of Elm Street. You know, look, those are my people. But my mother was wise, very wise. But speaking for some of my friends in the hood are dead in prison, on drugs, unemployed as of today. But due to integration and busing, as the buses arrived on campus at Pontiac Northern High School, my classmates were met with rocks, racial slurs, violence by the Ku Klux Klan, and a bunch of racist people. And what made it so, so contrasting is that I had left an all-black middle school and transferred to Flying so Yeah, I think, I think you fly back. <laughs> but I had uh, transferred from an all-black middle school to a 98% all-white middle school. Now, I didn't have a problem because I met new friends, I had a great time, but when both schools fed into the new, not the new, the white high school to integrate, there was violence everywhere. It was sickening, it was painful, because I had friends on both sides. I had to deal with this. As a matter of fact, I became the, the school snitch, nobody knew it. I would go to the principal office and say, Dr. Dow, it's going down by the gym. You better send some guards down there. Dr. Dow, go out to the bus yard. They gonna get it on. Go stop it, Dr. Dow. Because what was what we were experiencing as a high school student with adults trying to hurt us just because we wanted an education. That was a level of oppression that I saw happening in live living color. As a matter of fact, Google Pontiac bus burnings of 1970. You'd be shocked. The bus burns, yes, Ku Klux Klan burned up the bus yard, but it didn't stop immigration. Now one other example of oppression I share with you that many of you may experience one day in the workplace. Yes, I work for a proud big four CPA firm that hired very few minorities at that time. I was fortunate, majored in accounting, 
big four CPA firm, it was big eight back then, hired me in the city of Detroit. Of the 500 professional staff of auditors, tax accountants, and consultants, only five were African American in a city that was 80% African American. But I was fortunate. I got in, I worked hard, I trained people, and I got passed up for promotions twice. And what really hurt me was that my mentors, a manager and supervisor who were white, pulled me aside before the promotions were announced and said, Ren, we wanted to quit. We know you earned it, but they gave it to the boy that you trained that had blue eyes and blonde hair. And I said, okay, let me just kind of beat them at the game of doing what I do best and move on to somewhere else. But it happens. Those are forms of oppression that not only happen to people of color, they happen to women. They happen to different sexual orientations. So I say to you today that the best way to beat oppression as a start is treat everybody with dignity and respect. You feel loved and cared for when people treat you with dignity and respect no matter what you're involved with, who you're around. Dignity and respect goes a long way to helping humans feel human. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that actually leads into our next question. So we wanted to ask the panelists, how do you feel people could um, help decrease oppression in our community and here on campus? Um, and if you could keep it to a uh, limited time, because we are, we do want to open it up to the audience as well. But go ahead and answer that. So I think, oh, I think a way um, as a community, and even outside of the CI community, um, a way we can um, I don't want to say decrease, but I'll go with that word. Decrease the amount of oppression is obviously talking about it and I think educating ourselves about the history of not just black people, but people of color and what they have gone to, gone through based because of the color of their skin. And because I think if you don't look all the way from, if you don't study the history of black people and what they have gone through, what they have experienced, you're disengaged from what has truly what has truly happened. Like you're only seeing what's happening today. You're not seeing all the events that happened generations ago that are, that are affected today. So I think it's educating yourself about the history and not disengaging yourself about it. It may sometimes be uncomfortable, but I think it's okay. It, you have to be uncomfortable because it is something that some people may feel guilty about, some people may feel uncomfortable, they may feel um, kind of inferior talking about it at times because obviously I'm black so my ancestors were, were slaves and sometimes it is hard to talk about because you know it, it was a, something horrible that happened and I think also people people not of color who do understand it and get the Black Lives Matter, they need to talk to the people in their community about it and educate them because I think it's better if you have someone that looks like you or if you have someone that understands the Black Lives Matter and they're white, they can talk to someone else of their community who's also white and I felt like they would understand it better than if it was coming from a black person because they're automatically going to prejudge and say, you know, you're only saying that because you're black and I'm white and you're already judging me. So I think that's how we can start it. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this show, but it's called White People. And they're bringing white people into the conversation of race and racism. And I think that's something we need to do um, as a community because if we keep ignoring what happened and not discussing it, it just, it's just a recurring event. So I think that's how we can increase oppression. Thank you. Uh, hey. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, briefly, I, I think I have three points. Um, care, listen, and be aware of your own privileges. Um, care, A, is just care. Like, be concerned. Um, understand that it's not a 
uh, a specific phenomenon or a single incident, so just care what's going on. Um, listen, as Eugene said, um, don't try to don't try to talk people out of their experience. So care enough to listen to what their lived experiences are and um, understand where they are coming from. And then I think the last thing, by being aware of your own privileges, um, and I'll speak from my other privilege of being a man, um, just being aware that there are certain privileges in society, certain privileges that may be afforded to you that may not be afforded to other individuals. Um, I'm fully aware that I can be in a, in a meeting, for example, um, full of women and maybe with a few other individuals and I can be allowed to speak first or over women um, just because female voices are often unfairly suppressed in those type of settings but um, as a man you have to sometimes be aware that fall back, allow other people to speak and not exert your privilege just because you can um, and with that you give voice to other people so in the instance of for example um, maybe not being black, be aware of like what voices are represented here, what voices should be here, um, if you hear something out of, out of line, like how can I advocate for this population, um, how can I make a way for other people as well, so um, we all have privileges, but we have to be aware of our privileges in order to help other individuals. I'll chime in at this point. I learned a lesson from my wife. She's an educator in the Simi Valley School District. And we were having a discussion about some emotional situation. And I tried to tell her, oh, don't feel that way. I learned a valuable lesson from my wife. Not to ever make that statement again. But she made it very clear. Until you walked in my shoes, you can't tell me how to feel. And that has stayed with me for 28 years of being married. You know? I'm glad it happened early. But as I heard one of our panelists say, that until you walk in someone's shoes, you really can't begin to comprehend how they truly feel. You can have empathy, and you can care. And you can even ask questions to try to understand. And that's a starting point. But there are several things that I want to say that how we can approach this whole issue. A part of the oppression issue is that we all need to start at home. Look in the mirror and think, what have I done to make sure that I have done all I can do to deflect oppression? I'll give you an example, police brutality. Police are there to, they the guardians of democracy for everyone. They have a role to play. But when they encounter someone who will not obey commands, the conflict will escalate. And as I tell my son, who was a senior at Cal State University, at Cal Poly Pomona, all the time, every time I talk to him, I can text him, I can talk to him weekly, be careful, be respectful. If you get pulled over, just yes sir, no sir, no, what did I do? Why are you stopping me? Just, it's Johnny Cochran. Anybody know who Johnny Cochran is? He's a renowned attorney who is no longer with us. He's a fraternity brother of mine. He was the one who was the attorney for O.J. Simpson and Michael Jackson. Renowned. He is the one attorney that fought more police departments against police brutality and won settlements all over the nation. He was known for helping stop police brutality across the nation. But I, what I say is that I tell my son all the time, you're black in America, but you are a superstar. And until they know what's on the inside of you, your color of your skin is going to speak before you open your mouth. So I constantly tell folks personal responsibility and accountability. Every day you set foot out there, you can't control what someone may do to you, but you can control your behavior. The other thing is, understand the laws. Understand when a police can use force. I had the fortunate
big screen, big as the wall back there, a scenario, a robbery taking place, somebody beating somebody, and I would walk in with my gun, what would I do under the circumstances? And it would track how many times your bullet hit that bad person, too. I was pretty good. But anyway, it was so interesting when they asked me, why did I pull my gun out when I did? And they would analyze it and say, it was inappropriate that you did this. You were too late, you would be dead if you waited that long. So until you go through these experiences, you need to understand the law. When can police use, have use of force, deadly force? There are certain outlying situations where they gonna go in with guns blazing because of the circumstances of the situation. The other thing is, force your concern. Black Lives Matter is doing exactly that. They're raising their voice, they rally in support on issues, issues that many believe have fallen on deaf ears or there have been unjust judgments. Police officers walking free after gunning somebody down. I'm not a judge, I'm not a jury, but I know injustices do take place. Other thing you could do, get on your local police advisory boards, community policing advisory boards. We need more community policing. The more we interact with them and they interact with us, the less tension there would be. And that's needed because there's a lot of distrust and some of it is warranted, some of it's not. And finally, as we all try to seek justice all the time, because we deserve it. The Constitution protects us, but it don't mean that those who are supposed to carry it out is gonna obey it, so guess what we need to do? We need to always start building your legacy right now, this moment. When you leave this building, you can build your legacy about helping to increase justice out there, speaking up, trying to help people get educated. You're in the right place at the right time in this fine institution getting a great education. Everybody don't have that opportunity, but you can help them learn and direct them to resources. You gotta be involved in community services. Get your face out there. Be known that you are a person that stand up for the little man. And last but not least, you know, as they say, all work and no play, make Jack a dull boy. Pursue happiness, okay? Those are the things that can help us turn. We got a big ship ahead of us. It's not gonna turn overnight, but it's gonna gradually turn. The more of us put our oars in the water, it'll turn faster. Thank you. I agree with the, with the panelists here, uh, but also I think there's something that's a, been a, missing a little bit, and, and Dr. Uh, Bass was getting to that, is, is action, and what does that action look like? Um, and there's individual action and understanding what are your blind spots. That moment when you tell someone, um, I, I think you're making a big deal out of it, or that person uh, um, shouldn't have responded that way, that's why they're dead. Right? Those moments right there are blind spots. Uh, and you should understand how those blind spots individually um, uh, turn into something larger. Right? We're talking about 310 million people in the United States. And those individual actions reverberate into larger societal structures um, and how we look at these issues and how we address these issues. Um, and so you know, knowing what those blind spots are, is something that I really value what the Black Flag Matter movement is that um, they are queer affirmative, they are trans affirmative, they look at these varying issues because social justice is not just about one issue, but social justice is a, is a lot of issues that are affecting us. So how do we go out and change that, not just in our own lives, right, and how we do our everyday, um, but also how we participate in our communities and being a part of um, those, who, those, those who, uh, being a part of those structures that, that look over policing um, but also being a part of uh, taking a part in social action, right? Because if we, we have an investment. If, if you're not fighting 
that status quo, then you're standing for that status quo, whether you like it or not. We're not always aware of that privilege, that it is a privilege to sit with status quo. And if you're not doing anything about it, then you're saying it's okay, right? And so I know folks have a hard time in understanding that and knowing what, where, what is my first step. Uh, and that's where your investment happens as a person, where you begin to invest in making change and being participating and participating in nonprofits and groups that are attempting to make this change. Uh, so it, it is it is important to inform yourself and inform yourself and being a part of the dialogue. Those are first steps, but then also your actions. Right? How much are you invested in, in changing these directions that we're going in? Can you raise your hands if you have bills to pay? Okay. I know that all of us uh, have some financial responsibilities that we must attend to, right? Yes? 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 Yes. <laughs> but you can also afford to pay attention. Okay? So, what I mean by that is question the people in power about why there aren't a lot of black students here in the first place. Also, why we don't have a lot of black professors, it's things that we like do see, but we don't question, which lets systems that are in power just keep rolling, and then you don't get your voice heard, and then you don't make a positive change. So to reiterate what everyone else is saying, not only pay attention, but also take action. Because you know your word is only as good as your action is, and actions speak louder than words, as it is. Um, and then on top of that, I just want to say all black lives matter. The D-boys, the strippers, the people who can't read, the people who pass the white, the people who act white, the people who act too black, all black lives matter. So that's just something I want to touch on, but that's the end of my message. Thank you so much to the panelists for coming up here and sharing your experiences because we know that it's hard to do something like this in front of a lot of people, um, but your contributions help the cause.